And that was the dulcet tones of Fleetwood Mac there with the legendary The Chain, of course, the F1 theme tune for BBC for such a long time. We're back with the Warwick F1 show on Raw 12.51am with, for the first time in what feels like an age, a two-hour show, and I'm so glad. It's the last one of the term. Next week we'll be back online and you'll have you'll have plenty to, to watch for, for, again, what feels like the first time in quite a while but we're still here in the studio and i'm still uh i'm still jack Rowe, still hosting we're going to be joined by will kingswood he'll be taking over for probably the second half of the show maybe a little bit sooner than that but we do have regular co-host shimmei baratio with us how are you doing shimmei yeah i i'm good i can't wait for sunday but can just the next week it's just get out of the way just let sunday come i just want the lights to go out already oh me too i'm so hyped for friday already this is Oh, I want as much driving as possible. We've got returning guests as well. Um, Bethany seemed to, to quite enjoy having uh, being on the show. I think it was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and you're back again. Are you you ready for for the new season as well? Yeah, glad to be back. I, it's only been two weeks, but I really enjoyed it then, and I'm really looking forward to being here now, and really looking forward to F1. Can't wait for Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be amazing. Good, and we do have, I think. I so I'll call you a returning guest, but for the first time this term as well, and and the last time as for for myself and for Ziga as publicity officers for Warwick F1 Society, we've got Ziga back in the studio or back on the show because the last time you weren't in the studio, how are you how are you finding it in in the studio now? I think this is such a good change, like um, to, to, uh, like obviously this is a different experience, like being online, you're probably confined to being just uh, just in your room where. So, uh, being a student, at least you have an excuse to like meet 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 people and just just honestly in, enjoy yourself while uh while, whilst you're on it. So I think like, and also I th- I think it's go- it's sad that we are leaving our exec roles. I mean, um, but considering that, I think that we've definitely achieved a lot this year. So hopefully, the next uh, cohort of our exec will do a great, if not an even better, job than our cohort of exec. Yeah, uh, exactly as Sega said. I'm going to run through all the changes that are going to be happening around Warwick F1 Society, around Raw Sport, uh, and and around the show in general. Which, you know, for the last, it's a little bit emotional. So for myself and for Ziga, um, we're we're taking a, a break. Both of us were publicity officers last year. Uh, so the replacement publicity officer is Catch Plane, uh, and then the rest of the job will be split into two. And the lovely content creation officer, which is what you guys need to worry about, is Chimmei. Uh, are you looking forward to, to stepping into that role? Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. I hope I do a good job. <laughs> I think you will. And and of course, for the last 10 weeks, you'll have, you'll have seen uh, and heard Chimmei coming in and, and taking over that, that co-host, being that third co-host. Uh, and unfortunately, this does mean it's my last time in the hosting chair. I'm, I'm going to step out after this. I don't think there's any chance that you'll keep me away from the show. I'll be back on. As I guess as, as often as I'm allowed, I'm sure. Um, but it does mean that that I'll be taking that step back there. Um, and of course, for for Raw as well, we've got a new head of uh, sport for Raw. So Will Kingswood is, is taking over as head of news. And again, he should be. And I, I haven't spoken to him yet about this, but I'm hoping he's just going to keep going as co-host. Nothing will will change on that front. So for you listeners at home uh, or, or people listening live on the radio, nothing's going to change. Um, where things are going to change, though, um, and things have changed. Uh, this is the worst segue in the world. All right, Haas in Formula One. Because, um, uh, yeah, chuckle while you like. Um, you will have, I'm sure everyone's seen in the news. Uh, Nikita Mazepin is gone from F1. Uh, and, and his replacement is Kevin Magnussen. Now, we talked about on the show last week who we thought was going to be the replacement for, for Mazepin. And yes, Magnussen's name got mentioned. But I think most of the votes were on who? It was Hulkin back. Yeah, <laughs> it's unfortunately not happening. Um, would would you have preferred to see Hulkin back, or is this the best version of um, the the F one driver returning to to the grid? Um, in terms of drivers who, who were previous drivers I've, in F one, I feel like Magnussen was probably the best one, simply because Hulkin his last time in the full-time F1 seat, if I remember correctly, was 2019. And so that was a long time ago. He's only had three races in between. So he's. I feel like he 
you can't just come back from that longer break. You have some time to adjust, as Alonso showed. You don't just immediately come back in your top of top of your game. Whereas a single year out, especially in Magston's case, where he's been doing lots of other uh, motorsports, I feel like he's got a decent chance to be almost straight back in there, top top of his game, like nothing really changed. Yeah, and another one of those drivers that has just left Formula 1 and we think maybe is losing that chance to, to step back in was Giovinazzi. He was my pick. I think the other four people who are in the studio definitely didn't agree with me, but he's in Formula E and again, he's been snubbed in a way. I'm not sure you know, whether he's had the opportunity to step away from Formula E and come back in, um, but they didn't even look at him. Um, Magnussen was the first choice. Is that Does that surprise you? Knowing what you know about Gunter Steiner's relationship and and uh, and what what we had with Magnussen and and Grosjean in the past, I think um, if you had uh, when you saw like uh, Magnussen and Grosjean as pairing, like yes, they lasted a long time, but you got to remember like these these two also clashed um, on 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 track as uh, on track as well. Like take uh, look look at um, twenty twenty nineteen um, Spanish Grand Prix, like. They had they had a crash and then there was and then obviously we knew what happened in that dr- drive to su- survive when Gunter Steiner had that fiery debrief between the two drivers and we 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 knew what happened with the door next but I think but, but I think like um it's good that uh, Mag that Magnus Magnuson and Grosjean partnership is no longer a thing because had it um prolonged it um uh, it would have continued a toxic um atmosphere in the Haas camp and with with this Haas and uh with this Magnussen and Schumacher pairing um yes Magnussen may not be quick but he has the experience and the knowledge that he can he can bring to the Haas team and also give that um um uh, advice to Schumacher who remember He's still he's still inexperienced in F1, and obviously last year wasn't ideal because he only ha- he had a rookie teammate in the name of Nikita Mazepin. So I feel like um, for this for this year has um, struck really well with the balance uh, balance of youth and experience. Yeah, you've made a very controversial comment, very off off the cuff. There um, is Magnussen quick. I think I think it's a bit of a disservice to to say that he's he's, he's not quick. Um, what do you reckon, Jimmy? He is quick. I mean, I'll just pull you back straight to the Aust- to the qualifying Austria 2019 with the uh, well, back when in Haas's tumultu- very very fruit not so fruit for um, ha- rich energy days, and that car was really really struggling for pace. I think it was something like the ninth fastest car on the grid, and in Austria, Magnussen still managed to qualify. But that I mean. He qualified a lap that was fifth fastest, but I think he had some like a ten grid. He only had like a five place grid penalty because of some engine problems or something like that. So and Magnussen has delivered a lot in the past, so I feel I would disagree with that. What do you reckon, Bethany? Yeah, I agree. Magnussen is definitely a quick driver. You cannot say that a driver who who got a podium in their debut race is not quick. They just. Getting a podium in your debut race, that, it, that was a statement of intent. And even though he has struggled since and hasn't been able to replicate that podium, it still it shows that he's a quick driver. And yeah, it's, he's someone that Haas can definitely rely on. No, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm going to use that as the perfect segue because that was back in Australia, 2014, in the first race ever with new regulations that we had. And of course, we're going into exactly the same situation now. New regulations in 2022, a different racetrack, of course. Australia third on the calendar. We're going to Bahrain. We've tested here. Things are looking interesting. How much of the testing were you able to watch, Eager? And how much have you? How much can you? Can we take from that going forwards? Unfortunately, um, when the testing started, I was still busy um, submitting one of my deadlines. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to follow as much of it. But um, but from what I've noticed, like not even like thirty minutes into the session, Horner and uh, Horner and Wolf have already engaged in a war of words. Like they promised, like they'd move on from 
from like all these arguments from 2021. But as they say, um, uh, well, as a well, as as like in 20, 2021, things things don't change between Wolf and um, Horner. So I think it could be um, another long season of war of words between the pairing. Yeah, let's talk about the incident in question because um, I think then no, we'll, we'll go for the backstory first. We've got to go full um, full backstory on this one. But Mercedes rock up first day of testing. There are some rumours, right? No side pods. Did we mention that last week? I think it, I think it was just a little bit too soon. But no side pods. What if, I mean, thoughts, Shimei? Is there an, like I think my silence does it justice? But like crazy, right? Yeah, I like what. I was like, what? <laughs> Literally, I just... Yeah. A- have anybody else got anything to add to that? That's just like... I'll be honest. The best way that I can summarise it is actually paraphrasing Christian Horner, which is radical but legal. Like, I do think that it's within the spirit of the regulations, but it's definitely something that nobody would would have thought of outside of Mercedes. Like, it's just completely I it, don't know what to say it is a bit off the cuff isn't it um, Christian Horner didn't initially say that did he? let's let's talk about it so um, there's a German German uh, journalist company called Auto, let me let me get this phrase Automoto und Sport um, uh, who interesting um, interesting takes sometimes um but on this occasion they reported that christian horner had been essentially complaining about um, mercedes and then about half an hour after they that they posted that 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 rumor had gone out um red bull said initially that christian didn't say anything of the sort and then they said that no official statement had been made by red bull so what do you what can you what can we what do you think happened there, um, Ziga? Was that like him just talking to a mechanic or was that him trying desperately to take back something that didn't want to be said? I, th- I think um, it was one of those uh, things that Christian Horner was talking to someone and then suddenly out of nowhere there was that journalist who like heard something and then he just decided to re- re- uh, report it onto his, um, on- onto his sources and... Obviously, like there, there are many sources these days, so you really don't know which um, source that you should uh, believe in, especially in the world of F1. So, who knows if it's uh, if if it's true? Maybe Horn is just playing mind games with Mercedes. Yeah, is there any room for the for the idea that we give him the benefit of the doubt that this was um, he's talking to the media and he says something dumb and then he goes no actually we don't need this beef is, is that a, a, a possibility he's reneged on something that he said already yeah especially knowing Christian Horner how spontaneous and how unfiltered he can be he'll, he, he's not a person who will shy away from his from initial reactions he'll just blast it out and then at least if he's rejected, retracted it's not a big deal I don't think okay so I mean Let's talk about Mercedes then. They've they've got those bizarre side pod designs because they are technically side pods. They are still there, but they're so narrow. Um, but they're not been quick at testing, right? They've been that consistently about a second off the the top of the pace. They were one two at the end of uh, testing in Spain, but they've not been so good in Barcelona. Is this them sandbagging? Is this everything's going to be really close at the start of the season, or are they genuinely not going to be title contenders? What do you reckon, Bethany? I do think that they are sandbagging, but every team is sandbagging, let's be honest. So I feel like it's probably a combination of the two where they will probably be slightly behind the pace, I feel, but not as much as they say they will be. Lovely. And we've got, um, I think, probably the most underrated team at testing as well, Red Bull. They've not done anything wrong. They had an accident, I think... Or was it they had some issues just like day one or something, but they had pretty clean running um, and and they've been reasonably fast. But I mean, when we look at our, our plans, especially from people in the in the studio, nobody really rates them for that that title. Do you think we're just not giving them the credit they deserve, or or are they just not quite looking quite as fast, Seager? 
for me um for me i think like uh like with with testing like timings are not really an accurate representation of how t te uh teams are so obviously in testing teams might um have different uh di different configurations so obviously it skew uh skews the timing a bit um and and with testing it's really difficult to see who is out on on top but what is known from testing is like in Barcelona and Bahrain Ferrari have uh, Ferrari for sure have been consistent yeah I don't think there's any doubt about that um, we're going to talk about the other the other teams that might be challenged for a title because Mercedes and Red Bull we're not really sure where they stand so that'll happen after the break before that here is I don't want to talk by glass animals Hello and welcome back to the second section of the Warwick F1 show, doing our two hour long season preview with myself, Jack Rowe. And of course, we were talking about testing last time around. We got about halfway through that, talking about Mercedes, talking about Red Bull, talking about um, at least Magnussen stepping into the car. Uh, but now we're going to talk about someone else who might be might be vying for the title. And, and who do you reckon I'm, I'm talking about here, um, Ziga? You were talking about them just before the break. Yes, I was uh, before the break. I was talking. Uh, I, I mentioned that Ferrari throughout testing were consistent. Like they were bagging over one hundred laps every day, and oh, and Ferrari um, this this year have one one of, if not the most strongest um, l lineup. I think I think this lineup might be stronger than the Mer Mer Mercedes one. So. There's a good chance that um, Charles Leclerc and Carl Sainz could f uh, fight each other out for the title, but knowing Ferrari, they will apply their internal politics to fa favour one driver for for the title. Now that is a bold call and some bold predictions in there as well. Chimmy, what do you reckon? Sainz and Leclerc better than Russell and Hamilton? I would say in terms of raw pace, no. But maybe they can be a more effective team because the fact that they might, I would say, there's more likely that they'll be a better, they'll be better working as a team. I feel like Russell and Hamilton. There's a good chance that there may be a clash of egos here, a, cl a good clash at the time because both of them are extremely fast drivers. But I mean, we have to see how the season goes on anyway. Okay, Bethany, what do you reckon? What's your what's your pick for the best the best lineup? I'd say that the Mercedes duo, they've got the they're the better pairing in my opinion, just because you've got statistically the greatest of all time. Subjectively, might not be, but that's not something we. That's the kind of worms we don't want to dive into. Well, our viewers <laughs> know that he's at least the top two. We've worked that out. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> Um, that's and that's then, on our Instagram story, so you can always uh, check out Warwick F1 Society on Instagram if you don't already. I don't know why you wouldn't already. And I'll let you keep talking about that. <laughs> keep going, sorry. As I was saying before that shameless plug. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and then we've got George Russell, who's just an up-and-coming, brilliant driver. And he's got a podium. He qualified P2, got a podium in the Williams last year, which was... A, a bottom three team you that's you've got to have a lot of talent to be able to do that so yeah i feel like and i feel like actually they won't clash as much as people think they will simply because russell's a n new to the team technically he's been a mercedes junior but he's this is the first time he's been in the mercedes team proper as a mercedes full-on driver so I feel like Hamilton will be able to, at least this season, take that number one slot. Not convincingly, but he will be able to take it. And I feel like it's more likely, actually, that the Ferrari drivers will trip over each other. So that's something that I think we're going to talk a bit more about later. Yeah, speaking of drivers who are not going to be tripping over each other, um, Lando Norris had a rather rough time of testing. Um, his uh, teammate Daniel Ricciardo, of course, testing positive for COVID halfway through. And that did leave him... Um, all on his own, stranded uh, in, in that McLaren. And that McLaren had lots of brake issues throughout, but how much of 
So Norris himself, of course, had the, the most laps of anyone. That's not surprising. He, he didn't have to share the car. But McLaren only reaching just shy of half what the the numbers that Mercedes who hit. hit um, Mercedes, of course, had the, the most number of laps in testing. How much of that do you think is the fact that Norris can't drive for eight hours a day and how much do you think is, is down to the issues that they had, Jimmy? I think it's a lot more to do with the issues. I think that McLaren breaking issue is probably something that's going to be really concerning, especially when McLaren admitting saying that it's not an easy fix. And they did actually bring some, I think they tried to bring some fixes on the last day of testing and it wasn't completely working. And the thing is, I think the McLaren does have a lot of raw pace in it, but I thought that they might have a lot of issues going into Bahrain because of this cooling issue they've got. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think they tried to bring bigger air ducts as well. Um, I've, while I've got the opportunity to make another nice segue, we've got, um, of course, something that probably most of the grid has been struggling with, um, and that's a new buzzword in the paddock, uh, porpoising. So, of course, with the, the new regulations, we've got ground effect coming into effect. Um, and when that, that, essentially, it makes a seal under the car. Um, if that seal gets broken, the car springs back up and then, a whole rush of air comes underneath, increases the downforce, and you get this bouncing effect down the straights. And it's been particularly prevalent um, on some of the cars that think, I think Mercedes, right? Yeah, I think and Mercedes had it the worst. Alpine had some bad porpoising. Yeah. Do you think that's going to be something that'll be fixed by the time we get to to testing? Just uh, sorry, um, uh, practice sessions in just a couple of days' time, or, or or at least the race day, uh, Sega. The pro- yeah, with with this porpoising issue, like it uh, it means like dri- drivers um, are not willing to push as much when it comes to, uh, comes uh, comes to going going down the straight, and so cars won't hit top speed um, as much as they'd like to be. So I th- uh, I think like um, some some say whoever fixes uh, whoever's the first to fix these por- porpoising issues might be the first. Um, uh, to win, uh, to win the Bahrain Grand Prix, and from what I've heard so far, it's uh, Ferrari have mitigated it, and and so have Red Bull. But um, I, th- I think um, I think porpoise, uh, this porpoising issue, like I th- I'm confident a lot of the teams will get this um, issue fixed uh, by Bahrain. If if not, like as soon as soon as we land in I- Imola perhaps yeah let's uh, let's finish off our testing talk now we talked about Forbes and we talked about some of the teams that are involved but um, we need to talk about Haas again and that feels like something I've said far too often that we've said far too often in the last three weeks um, they're not a team that are renowned for good luck it seems um, and uh, in Turkey their, their plane which um, self somewhat chartered by the FOM um, broke down which meant they weren't able to make uh, the first morning of testing on Thursday so they had running um, at different times I believe uh, it was one hour on the Friday and Saturday mornings and two hours on the uh, Saturday afternoon uh, for, for Magnussen and Schumacher to, to run in and, and they really lit up the, the times I think both of them um, first and second uh, by the end of uh, each individual day was that just because things are cooling down or or because they're on their own on the track they've had more time on one particular day um, how much is this going to help them or hinder them uh, Bethany I think that this is going this I think like because uh, I don't know for certain but if I remember correctly I think that the cameras weren't running at those times so as a result they could just turn up their engine as hard as they wanted and so nobody would be able to know how much they turned up their engines or whatever. So they can post fast times and attract sponsors. So I think this is going to help them in terms of sponsorship, but I don't think it's indicative of their pace. That's an interesting take. Okay. But I do think what is clear is they made improvements even you know even before we take into account the the changes to regulations they were faster in bahrain than at least Mazepin's testing time uh, sorry uh, qualifying time from last year. So do you think that's the, is that just like the worst team on the grid taking that step up, or is this 2022 not being as much of a step back as, as we think, Jimmy? Or maybe just Mazepin that being just it, it's, that it, Yeah, bad. okay, it could be that, to be fair. <laughs> um, what, what do you reckon it is? I think it could be a mixture of both, to be fair. I mean, yeah, I think there's not really much to say on that. I think it could just be a mixture of both things, and 
things being cooler and you know i think that's what i think okay um is there anything else to add about it? yeah go for it Sega. you gotta remember that um has uh, has wrote off 2021 so uh, essentially good to steiner admitted that has will be at the back of the grids and the priority and so the priority for 2021 was uh, to ensure their rookie drivers mazepin and schumacher got enough um drive driving experience going into the new re- re- regulation for 2022s and I've, 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 and and going into testing, I've, um, Has did still have uh, some issues, but um, I think I think with um, Maz- Mazepin out, this um, I think Has Has could um, get get themselves off off the foot of the, could could challenge themselves to get themselves off the foot foot of the table, which. Um, which is going to be important for them because, as uh, Jean has said, like there's a lot of mi- uh, minuses in in that bank account and has uh, has are struggling financially. So, get uh, improving on their position from last year is a is a must um, for them for sure. So, which uh, which could attract them new sponsors and g- uh, given that they are an American team. Um, they want to they want to try expand that publicity into america to raise uh, the uh to promote f1 in general yeah and uh, another thing with Haas, another thing with Haas. oh my good um their their new livery of course talking about sponsors you remind me um just after the show last week uh, i believe it was on the thursday as as, as always happens with the curse of of um, when i publish these shows um has came out with their, their new livery. Uh, uh, an interesting take. I think pretty much just the what they had before with no Euralkali on it and no blue on it. Um, where do we put that in terms of uh, of our rankings we had before? I'm going to go back to Will and he's here in the studio at last because uh, mm-hmm. you were here. You were here last week as well. What do you mm-hmm. think of the livery? I don't. I think I put it very similar to the all white one. I don't. I think it's uh, probably as good looking. I just think it works in different ways and. I'm slightly disappointed they didn't do maybe a bit more different, but it's a good looking livery and I think that leaving a lot of the white as well helps the car stand out on a field that's quite quite dark in terms of their the colour spectrum. Reasonably blue as well. Yeah. Um what do you reckon, Jimmy? Improvement as is? Like where'd you rate it? Yeah, I think I wouldn't change it to be fair. I think I'm just looking at the rankings that we did last week. And we put Haas above AlphaTauri and the two Alpine liveries. And I think I might keep it there, to be fair. I mean, like I will say, the white makes it pop out in front of all the... Uh, mm. yeah. Who is just above Haas? Um, we got Mercedes. Okay. I'd put, I'd put it above Mercedes, but I would have done that anyway. What do you reckon? A, a significant improvement? A small improvement, Bethany? Um, I think it's a small improvement, but probably not enough of an improvement to bump it up any rankings compared to any other teams. Okay, Sega? I think the removal of the blue, I think, um, was uh, was probably the um, the best, uh, what was uh, was, a, was a good thing for Haas because they did, because by removing the blue, um, it means that the, the team is not associated with any country, which I will not go into any details it, uh, into for sensitive uh, reasons. <laughs> yeah, I would have liked to see them like, just put like a really, really subtle, just like American flag, just in the background. That would be nice because they need to fill that space as well, um, as best they can. Uh, especially if you're Alcala trying to get their money back. Um, we're going to talk about some some more general stuff. We'll talk about the season as a whole coming up. Um, before that, though, this is Borderline by Tame Impala. Welcome back to the Warwick F1 show. I'm, I've, I'm hosting now. I was meant to be hosting from the beginning, but I got dragged away on a thing. Welcome back to the Warwick F1 show. As we were talking um, after the break, and that is now, we're going to be talking about uh, the driver swaps that have happened this season. Now they've all hopefully been finalised. We're going to discuss, I guess, who we think out of all of them might have the best, best season. Maybe not best statistically, because obviously... That benefits some of the drivers in the top teams, but maybe the best season overall. So we've had Russell moving to Mercedes, uh, swapping with Bottas, 
who has moved to Alfa Romeo. He's partnered by Guan Yu Zhou, obviously, in Alfa Romeo as well. Uh, Alex Albon moving back to Williams. Uh, Kevin Magnussen, obviously, coming in to Haas, as we mentioned before. Have I missed anyone? I don't think so. I'm just too good. No. Uh, no, yeah, so I think I think that is everyone. And I guess we'll start right at the top. Obviously, the biggest change of a team, arguably the biggest change that of a team that's been quite stable, obviously, since 2017 in their driver partnership. But now sort of moving away from maybe that driver one-two driver structure in Hamilton and Bottas, maybe looking towards the future post Lewis Hamilton, George Russell moving to Mercedes. Obviously, the news came, I think, after the Belgian Grand Prix and before uh, the Dutch Grand Prix. And do you think that after testing, obviously testing is quite difficult to say how good all of the drivers are. They're obviously all running different setups and strategies. But do you think George Russell is betting in well to the team, Jack? I mean, it's really difficult to say from testing. I think you're right about that, at least. Um, we could see, we, you know, you can guess a bit about the teams, but I, I don't know what to say about drivers. I think it is clear that he's going to fit in well. I like the fact that he changed his helmet away from away from the louder one, cause it, or, 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 you know, the red... I think it was initially for, for louder, but he looked like Schumacher, and I'm glad he's changed that way. He's gone black. Um, it fits in nicely there. And I think kind of the culture's not going to be too different from what he's expected he's been part of the, the the mercedes academy for so long so i don't expect it'll be too much of a step up for him it's just a question of where the car is and what his teammate is like obviously um what what hamilton is doing what lewis can do um is going to change a lot about um how this team fares for the next year yeah and i mean um Chime, obviously lewis coming off a very disappointing end to the season um, just losing out on his seventh world, or eighth world title on the final lap of Abu Dhabi. Do you think that that will change the dynamic heading into this this season in particular, where Mercedes maybe maybe not won't sacrifice George Russell if he's like a lot quicker and we see like a 2014 Red Bull situation? But do you think that there could be that recognition from George Russell? I think as we mentioned before, that maybe this season is. I guess is about Lewis. It's about getting him that eighth title. It's about writing what they perceive as the wrong from last season. And Russell may play more of a supporting role in his first season and then might move up in terms of like competing with Lewis as we go over to them, over the next few. I'll probably say definitely because it's not just that it's Russell's first season Mercedes as well and he is competing against statistically the most successful driver of all time and on top of that because of the, the whole thing of Abu Dhabi Lewis is going to be hungrier than anybody has probably ever been to get that world title especially getting the Nathan and break, breaking the record of all records in Formula 1 so I think yeah I think we probably might expect Russell to expect Expect Russell to play a little bit more of a supporting role, especially this season, in that respect. Okay. And um, I guess, Bethany, do you think that there will be that sort of... Maybe if, if he starts off playing a supporting role, but then sort of has like is very closely matching Hamilton, and especially if Mercedes have done what they normally do, decided to sandbag and then rock up and blow everyone away by a second at uh, Bahrain next week. Do you think that we'll start to see more of, a, I guess, a Rosberg-Hamilton situation, what we saw in 2014, where they do start to come together? Or do you think that Merce because Mercedes want Russell, might want Russell to play more of a supporting role, do you think he won't want to ruffle any feathers and will play that role? Or do you think that he'll want to go for it? Do you think that he'll want to be able to be challenging for that title? Personally, I think that what's probably most likely to happen is that they will be allowed to race in the first half of the season, basically. And then Mercedes will see who's ahead, number one and number two situation for this season. I think it's more likely that Hamilton will be that number one, but there could be a situation in which Russell immediately becomes the number one, though I do think that's more unlikely. I don't think that we'll see them properly clashing because, of course... It, there was the Hamilton-Rosberg situation and 
if I remember correctly, Toto himself said that he doesn't want a repeat of that. So I think that if they do start buzzing heads, he will intervene severely. All right, and uh, I guess finally we'll go around. Give me, oh, starting off with Ziga, uh, give me your, I guess, prediction for how well you think George Russell do. Maybe number of wins and uh, position in the world title race. I think um, since this is Russell's first season as at Mercedes, I think he'll get like one, one or two wins. Um, oh. You know, I, if if I go be a bit crazy, I'd probably say Russell to win the British Grand Prix. Yeah. That's a, that's one. That's a. I'd like to say one of my crazy crazy prediction because obviously obviously Silverstone is Hamilt- Hamilton's territory, but you never know. George might come in and crash the party. <laughs> but um, generally, I think um, Russell. In terms of qualified pace, we know Russell has been nicknamed as Mr. Saturday during his time at Williams. He knows he can drag a car that is like the worst on the grid. Um, so I think he will push Lewis a lot, uh, a lot in qualifying. So he could, he could um, maybe out qualify him like a, f- a few times. Who knows? Um, and at times he, he does not out-qualify Lewis, he could be like maybe two tenths, one tenth, or even less less behind him. So I, th- I think like qualifying-wise, like it will be close, but get, get, guessing the result, it's going to be at that point of the season where Lewis will want that n- num- number eight. So... Mercedes will try and support um, Lewis as much as, he, m- much as he's, he can whilst trying to also encourage Russell to le- learn from Lewis as well. So even, th- even though they may clash, but um, it's going to be nowhere near as uh, when Rosberg and Hamilton were at Mercedes. It, ev- eventually, it, it'll be like... It's going to be kind of thing like in in the first season. It's the apprentice learning from the master. Mm. I mean, Jack, do you agree? Do you think Russell may be a bit closer in the qualifying battle than potentially in the races? Yeah, I think so. I think my prediction was going to be that he was going to beat Hamilton um, just like in qualifying. Um, he's going to win a race and he's going to be within 30 points in the world championship. I don't think Mercedes is going to be too good. I don't think they're going to win it this year, um, but obviously quite a, few, quite a few people disagree with me on that. Um, but I do think they'll be good enough for, for Russell to get that first win. Yeah. Uh, cheer, mate. Yeah, I think Russell will may win a race or two. I think may not may not be um, uh, Silverstone, but I probably think someone like Spa he might win, especially but that's where he did that mega lap in. Or somewhere around the sort of tracks or something like that, he might do well. And yeah, I think like Jack Al- I'll probably expect um, him to out-qualify out-qual- out-qual- for Hamilton. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that Russell is going to out-qualify Hamilton over the course of the season, but I think that Hamilton will be ahead of him in the races more often. Um, overall, if I had to guess how many wins Russell get, I'm, a- I'm actually more confident in him than the rest of you, so I actually think he'll get three or four wins. And I feel like he'll, I think he'll come fourth in the championship. Okay. And obviously, uh, actually, most of the driver driver transfers are related to Russell this season. And we'll move on to the driver that's replacing him at Williams, Alex Albon. Obviously, coming into the sport in 2018, I want to say. Was it 27? 2019. Was it 2019? Yeah, it was 2019. 2019 was um, Russell and Norris, wasn't it? No, uh, Albon. When did that? Yeah, Al- yeah, yeah. Albon, 20, yeah. Well, did he join the same year? It was, uh, it was, yeah, a, it was, so. it was the, um, you know, the 2018 F, uh, F2 driver's life. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, 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 that was probably one of the best uh, F, F, F2 um, uh, dro- dri- driver grids uh, mm. ever. So yeah, so as Ziegler was saying, coming in in 2019, obviously being promoted to Red Bull halfway through that season with uh, when uh, Pierre Gasly got uh, demoted, uh, made it through the rest of 2019, through 2020, had 
a tough season, you have to say. Obviously being, uh, I think he was lapped a few times by Max Verstappen. Obviously that season quite unique in how it was. Then losing his seat to Sergio Perez for 2021 out of the sport for for a year, but has returned now with the Williams to partner up Nicholas Latifi. I think on our on the predictions that we've been doing on our show, it seemed like one of the most confident predictions from the qualifying battles in particular was that Albon would beat Latifi. And do you think that this will maybe be where we work out how good Latifi actually is? Because obviously they've been teammates before. I think Albon won the teammate battle. Uh, and it's been difficult to see how good the Williams really has been because it's been at the back of the grid for quite a while, especially when Latifi's been driving it. But do you think that now Albon is in the same team and the Williams is looking maybe slightly better, or like at least as far as we can tell, then this is where we both see whether Albon can make a redemption and really how good Latifi is? Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. Um, we saw the issue with Haas last year is it's just really hard to tell how good someone is when they're that step further back from everyone else. So we know Latifi isn't going to be world champion anytime soon. I think that's fair to say um, for him. But it's just a question of like how far off the average F1 driver he is. And if he can't beat Albon in the car that he's been in for, for two years already? So yeah, this is, 2019. Yeah, um, so, yeah, exactly. The same thing again. Uh, in, in that car, in his team, in um, you know, with, with Alex taking a year off, um, hitting probably an all-time low in, in his career, um, which feels weird to say because it's, it's not been much of a career for him. But, yeah, no, if he can't at least make it competitive with, with Alex, um, then, yeah, it's it's kind of it's looking a bit rough for you, mm. for, for, for Nick. I mean, Chime, do you think, do you have high hopes for Alex Albon this season? Obviously, he's had that experience now driving both... A, a midfield car in the Toro Rosso, quite a quick car in the Red Bull. And now, obviously, we don't know the pecking order, but you'd think Williams, maybe maybe midfield is their highest hopes and maybe a bit lower down. Do you think that he'll, he'll be able to perform? Yeah, I think definitely. I think having that year on the sidelines and just being the background of the Red, background of Red Bull will help him just sort of like reflect and sort of help. Re refocus himself into a much better driver than he was when he left Red Bull. Obviously, he was struggling back then. Hopefully, he doesn't struggle now. Okay, and um, I mean, uh, just open to Bethany and Ziga, and um, if you want to say anything else about Alex Albon, because obviously we have seen him before. He is coming back in. These cars are new, so obviously no one's really got experience. It's a bit more of a level playing field. So, do you think that Albon has a chance of doing really well this season, or do you think that? Maybe he might need some time to get reacquainted with Formula One. I think a bit of both. I think that he's going to need some time to get reacquainted to Formula One, but not as much as any other driver who's returned recently. Like, for example, Alonso or even Magnussen, because of the fact that he's been doing tests and reserve duties for Red Bull. So I feel like he will be able to adjust quicker but at the same time he is going to a new team so he will need a little bit of time but I feel like he will be at the very least a match and most likely he will be able to beat Latifi in my opinion okay um, even even though like um, Albon's been out of the sport for a year I think going to Williams there's there's not really much pressure for him to perform because Remember, Williams have uh, come come off uh, like while well, George Russell there like uh, three three seasons where they were struggling at the back of the grid, and now now they uh, they probably got an improved car. So all Albon has all Albon has to do is just perform to the best of his ability, and I think uh, and like um, given that Latifi and Albon have equal cars, um, I think. Um, Albon, Albon, Albon will be uh, Latifi. The quest, the bigger question is, how close will Latifi be to Albon? And if he is really that far off, 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 off the pace from Albon, then this might be the end of um, 
the uh, end, end of uh, uh, end of uh, Latifi's F1 career because uh, Doralton says that they don't need uh, need that sponsor money anymore. But they kept uh, Latifi last year because he was showing he he was actually showing improvement uh, when com compared um, with uh, with Russell and obviously I think like Russ Russell and Latifi like the combo combo combination worked really well in. With uh, Williams' this, uh, journey, uh, journey to re rebuilding, with Russell providing the talent and Latifi providing the financial support, along with Doralton. So, uh, so if Latifi, ca uh, so even though Latifi will probably not be Albon, it's a, uh, if he can be as cl if he can be close to him, then that could justify his. Um, place in F1 because at least Williams know they can have a number one and a number two to count on. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I just want to go in with the, the people's vote on this. So we've got the qualifying battles for both, which isn't quite the same as the, the driving. But I, um, when we had people in the podcast, it was 10 votes for ten votes for Albon, one for Latifi. Um, the the general society as a whole, a little bit more favour uh, to Latifi, but it's still just over 75% in favour of Albon. So... Uh, I think it's fairly conclusive uh, on that front, at least what what everyone thinks about what's going to happen. What will really happen, oh, I'm, I can't wait to see. Well, that's what we'll find out in the first race of the season this weekend. And obviously we've discussed Magnussen, so probably not much else to talk about there. And so we'll move on to the final team, all change at Alfa Romeo. Obviously Valtteri Bottas, who was replaced by George Russell at Mercedes, moving to the Italian outfit to be joined by Guan Yu Zhou, obviously an F2, F2 graduate coming into the sport, first Chinese driver to enter Formula One. And it's a very, it's a bold, it's a bold strategy. Obviously, Alfa Romeo probably needed that, needed that experienced driver. And I think that's what Valtteri Bottas brings to the table, obviously, maybe entering the uh, twilight of his Formula One career, obviously moving away from Mercedes and away from that top team, uh, partnering up, obviously, with a rookie from F2, who he's had some success, but he's not... If, you, if he didn't have the money, you would have to say he's not the person that I think they would have chosen. So do you think that... Do you think that this could... Chime, do you think that this could be maybe another... The Haas situation in that there is one driver that is probably likely to perform and then there's another driver that is more there for the money and may start to flounder rather than succeed. Maybe, but not as extreme because I think Guan Yu has at least some talent where I don't like to continually bombard how I don't like in one driver, but I think we can say that Mazbin does not have the talent remotely close to the talent that's required of Formula 1 I think a lot of people would probably agree with that but I think when Joe, I think I'm willing to give him a chance but I'm not really sure that we can expect much from him okay and do you think that I mean um, Bethany do you think that he might have an even tougher job because obviously Valtteri Bottas well he maybe didn't have the best season last season isn't a bad driver he's taken I think 10 or so F1 wins, has challenged Hamilton on a lot of occasions, has occasionally been better than Hamilton on a lot of occasions. It it seems like, not that he's been, Joe's not been setting up to fail, but he could potentially have a very tough job trying to keep up with Bottas, which potentially could feed some of his critics. Yeah, Bottas is a pretty talented driver, so it's definitely a high bar for Zhou Guan Yu, as he's asked to be called. So yeah, it's definitely going to be a very difficult season for him. And he's only got a one-year contract as well compared to Bottas's. I think it was a three-year contract at the very least. So yeah, it's going to be a very difficult season. And there's Terry Paul share in F2, Alfa Romeo's golden child, basically. <laughs> So yeah, for good reason as well. It's not like he's he's done nothing. Porsche is very talented. Yeah, so so I got to jump in in in, <laughs> in defence of my boy. 
he's got a good, so Taylor Porsche has got a good chance to win the F2 season. So that so Joe Guan Yu's seat is very under is very under fire. He's really got to show that he's a very talented driver just straight out of the box because otherwise his seat is pretty much guaranteed to be lost the very next season to Taylor Porsche. It's going to be a tough season. Yeah, I just want to run through what Joe's done so far. Um, so he spent one year in uh, Italian F4. He came second. And then three years in Formula 3 European Championship, uh, where he came 13th, 8th, and then 8th. So he's not really on top there. But 2019, he steps straight into to Formula 2 um, without going through Formula 3 proper first. And he comes seventh in his first season, which is excellent. And then in the last couple of years, he's he's finished um, sixth and third. So it's just like he's definitely got talent. I mean, that, that first season in Formula 2 proved that he had enough, but i just not seeing the improvement from him enough to, to say that he's going to be able to, to compete in Formula 1 at a good enough level. The one, uh, one thing with uh, Guan Yu Zhou in F1 is like F1 want to expand their market into China as well because that's one thing they, uh, they see potential for sources of revenue and don't get me wrong, like China is a, a growing market and there's already talks of a second Grand Prix at the, um, in China in addition to Shanghai in International Circuit so so could could uh, so Guan Yu Zhou needs to prove that he's not just there, just 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 for commercial reasons. Like, if he wants, like if he wants to have that sustain sustained revenue income for China, he has um, he has to perform. Otherwise, F one lose it loses out on poten potential rev revenue uh, from China. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think it is a tough one, especially, as Jack was saying, if he does need those years to sort of bed himself in, it could be a difficult one, especially with just that one-year contract. We'll take another quick break, but just before that, we'll run through. So the five drivers, so Russell, Bottas, Joe, Magnussen, and... Albon. Albon, that was the other one. Out of them, not who's going to have the most successful season, because I think uh, unless something goes horribly wrong with the Mercedes, it's going to probably be Russell. Who do you think will have the se the best season? So the season that's going to be most above expectations out of those five. And we'll go around, starting with Jack. I mean, I'm not sure if it counts as above expectations, but I think Magnussen is going to be coming back into a team he's familiar with, but with all of the pressure off. Before, there's that bad relationship, but now he's done them a favor as it, as it were he's replaced probably the most hated driver we've had in formula one in a long long time so i think the pressure's going to be off uh, he's going to he's going to perform well however i do think there is expectation on him just because you know it's he's so much better than mazepin right mm. um so yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna stick with 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 magnuson okay uh Chimo? i'm going to probably go the same magnuson i think I think people just. I think some people don't realize how under he's. He can be a very underrated driver at times, and he has a lot of pace. And I think he will show, especially like Jack said, he's got a lot less pressure because he knows the Haas team very well. Okay. Ziga. I'm gonna actually say Albon this time because um, Albon has experience like both in the midfield team and uh, and in the top team. Um, obviously, when he was at Red Bull, he was up against. Max Verstappen, who basically who basically had a team on him, and he knows what is uh, what it's like to men mentally perform under pressure. And with this move to Williams, I think he's a he's in an environment that is supportive, and so will allow Al Albon to pursue his ambition. So perhaps maybe like Al Albon could do something. Um, special, special for Williams. Who knows? <laughs> okay, and finally Bethany. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you and say Albon. But I think it's going to be a combination of people slightly underestimating Albon because how much he was decimated by Verstappen. But also, I think just people underestimating 
Williams as a whole, I think that they're going to do best than most people think they will. And as a, as a result, I think that Albon will severely over o, overperform his, the expectations of most of the F1 community, okay. which I think will be brilliant for both him and Williams. Yeah, interestingly, no one, no one's saying, no one's saying Russell. Maybe he'll just pop out the blocks at Bahrain and then go on to win the title by 150 points. Uh, we'll take a quick break now, and then after the break, we'll come back. We'll look at the Warwick F1 Society predictions, discuss how accurate we think they are. But first, we first. First, I was reading Earth, the Wind of Fire, and I went first. Do you want me to go back to hosting? No, I can do it. Uh, but first, we have Earth, Wind, and Fire with September. That was Earth, Wind, and Fire with September. Welcome back to the Warwick F1 show as we now move our attention to not the people on the track, but maybe the events on the track. What will happen over the next season? We'll be using uh, the Warwick F1 2022 prediction game as, as it says on there, a very, very uh, fun and ingenuitive uh, name. That is definitely not a word, surely. Uh, I'm going to plug it again. You can go to our Instagram or check out our newsletter if you're a member of the society. And if you're not, why not? Uh, join, join in and, and join up. Join. It's free. It's free. Yeah, it's free. And come... Oh, have we, have we promoted the race watch along yet? We have not. We should come, do that. Come to the Clarendon on Sunday and watch the Bahrain Grand Prix with everyone. Starts at 2pm. Uh, so the race starts at 3pm, but we'll be there from 2pm. Have you been watching F1 on your own? Is that a yes? Don't do it anymore. Come and, ha- come and drink uh, alcohol occasionally if you feel like it. Eat discounted food, because we get discounts as well, and then argue with people for three hours about anything that goes on during the race. Will, will you be our next advertising head? <laughs> I, I am here all week, and I am, I am free for advertising, if anyone, if anyone wants to hit me up. But no, I personally have really enjoyed going to the races. I, I missed out on the Abu Dhabi one last, last year. I can't imagine the carnage that took place in the pub on that day. I can't remember it. I blanked it was out it my bad? mind. Yeah. I was uh, I, I, I was in Spain that day with, uh, along, with, along with like three of my other mates watching F1 mm. on a VP, on on a VPN. And as soon as the, as soon as that um, as soon as that was there, I, I was like, I I should not speak about the events for the next few days. If I speak, <laughs> I am in big trouble. <sighs> yeah, make sure make sure to come along. Come along to the Clarendon, obviously. Be there from two, starting from the race, starting from three. So it should be a good one. But we'll move back to the prediction game and starting off with the World Drivers Champion. So 30 responses, 15 saying Hamilton, seven with Verstappen, five with Leclerc, and then one each for Russell, Sainz, and one for Lando Norris. So obviously there... Seemingly Hamilton, Hamilton looking like the favourite, or at least what most people, most people think he'll be able to take his eighth world title. Obviously, um, when did this go? Did this go live before testing? No, no, it was uh, on Monday. So it's, this is in the last two days, three days that people have submitted these. So yeah, even even after even after testing, people still feeling confident about Lewis Hamilton. Is that the same for everyone? I think we've all done our podcast predictions, but do we all think that Lewis Hamilton has the best chance of winning it? I'm the single vote for Norris. Um, I think I think. I said that on the podcast before testing happened, um, and obviously McLaren have maybe not had the best testing ever, but I thought I'd just stick with it just to be interesting. Um, and I do think probably people are underestimating them, underestimating them, what is the word? Underestimating. Underestimating them a little bit. It's good to see that we can both talk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but between the three of us, <laughs> between the three of us, we could probably make one competent hoax host, couldn't we? Yeah. So I can't even say that word. Maybe. <laughs> but I think... It does seem at the moment like that prediction for the top spot is one of the most up in the air predictions. So interestingly, no one, no one going for Russell there. So uh, both Ferrari drivers getting votes. Um, actually, did someone? Oh no, one person voted Russell. So both Mercedes, both Ferrari, and then uh, Verstappen and Norris, obviously. But. I don't know about you, uh, you three that are left, but I cannot for the life of me work out who is the best car 
I think Ferrari are up there. I think Red Bull are up there. I imagine Mercedes are probably sandbagging. They normally do it. McLaren seem to be good. Then Haas are putting in good laps. So it's it, it's so up in the air at the moment about who has the best car. Because let's be honest, you need at least the best car, at least close to the best car, to win the title. I think it was basically equal last season between Mercedes and Red Bull. So do you think that? Do you have any idea, um, Ziga? I think um, with the, uh, with now a twenty two twenty three race se- season, like. Not having just the fastest car is enough for you to win. Consist- consistency is key throughout the season. And we saw that um, it all went down to the final race because both Lewis and Max Verstappen were super consistent throughout the season. And, most, and, and, most of the reti- and none of them had um, retirements related to like car... Rel- Car, reli- car reliability, mm-hmm. so that just shows how much um, reliable the cars have been since F1's first start, uh, first um, started back in 1950. So for me, for me, it's who 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 is who who is going to be the most consistent throughout the season. And from from testing so far, as I said earlier, um, Ferrari have been. Con- really 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 consistent so if they can keep it up if they can keep that up throughout the season and obviously there's also the external pressure around them um then i i reckon i could see leclerc and size in the in, in in the fight for the title yeah and um looking at the so looking at where everyone has ranked the teams uh, in the constructors' title as well. So, both Mercedes and Ferrari getting seventeen and thirteen for number one. Actually, only Red Bull. Only two people think that they'll win the constructors' title. And um, the top four actually all uh, Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, and McLaren. So people seemingly quite confident that those four are going to going to sort of challenge for the title. And then uh, the other teams a bit further down, I think Alpine, Alpha Tauri, Aston Martin, teams like that, I think people are more accepting the midfield. So it seems like, uh, Bethany, that people think it's going to be a lot closer at the top and also a lot, but they haven't moved any of the midfield teams up to sort of like that top table that we saw last year, those teams that could realistically well mercedes and red boys could fight for wins realistically if those lot came under any issue then you'd be looking at mclaren and ferrari and then you'd be looking down to the rest of the field but do you think that do you think that there is any chance for maybe some of the lower teams to climb up to that uh ferrari mclaren mercedes red bull level um personally i think that those top four teams are going to stay the top four teams but there is going to be some shuffling between them so, because realistically, like last year, McLaren and Ferrari were midfield teams. I feel like there's still going to be two top teams. So I think that's going to be Mercedes and Ferrari. And then I think McLaren's going to be a little bit behind and then Red Bull a little bit more behind. Okay. But I feel like that those four teams are still going to be slightly ahead of the midfield. Okay. Um, and, Chime, do you agree? Do you think that those four are the teams to beat, looking at it? Obviously, McLaren have had their braking issues, haven't been able to stop their brakes from overheating. But do you think once that gets sorted out, we will be looking at maybe... I can't even remember the last time of the four-team four, four team battle. I'm thinking back to 2010. I know there was Ferrari, uh, Ferrari McLaren and Red Bull, obviously. Was 2012 four teams? Not quite. No, that was. No. I think that was. Yeah, there's. I can't think of a time we've had a fourteen battle. So, do you think that this could be the year, or do you think that one team has maybe been uh, holding a little bit back, let's say, before they turn up at Bahrain for proper? No, I think it might be one or two teams, if I'm honest. Especially this cough coughs. Of one team that we all know that has a reputation for sandbagging. I think it's definitely been sandbagging. But I think there could be, there's definitely the potential for at least three teams. I think predominantly Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari would probably be.
be equally viable to contest for the Constructors' Championship. Maybe McLaren will be a nice fourth. And maybe I'm probably, I'm probably being over-optimistic, but I did actually vote has to be fourth in the predictions for no... Just to be oh, extreme. you're that madman. Oh. I was wondering who that was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't think it's a inconceivable idea. No. It I is, just, it's just so up in the air at the moment. Yeah, I just, no you, I just chucked it. We are just going to have to wait for probably uh, even Saturday yeah. to just see where all the teams are. Yeah, and if you want to talk about <laughs> predicting teams being highly placed, then I went for Williams fifth. But I think that potentially they might even be, like, if they have a really good season, they might be fighting with Red Bull for fourth. I don't think they'd... I don't think even in a perfect world they get that fourth, but... This is when we turn up and find out someone like Aston Martin have just been sandbagging by four <laughs> seconds a lap, and they're just a second a lap ahead of everyone. Well, I think we'll move, we'll move away from the teams, because at the moment it is completely up in the air. We'll rock up at Bahrain, we'll all be completely wrong, Mercedes will be last, Haas will be first, and it'll be just the reverse of last season. So we will move on to most driver of the day. So Leclerc with seven, Norris with four votes, Sainz also with four, Verstappen with seven, and Russell with six. So I think most people have been saying George Russell on our, um, on our podcast predictions. Obviously, driver of the day, immensely fickle. Like, you can get, you basically can start last through your fault get up to fifth and win driver of the day. Do you think that do you think that maybe there will be le- more spread, especially because the cars might be a bit closer and there might be more people at the top? And especially maybe if the cars are close together, it'll be more difficult to do those last to sixth or fifth or fourth or whatever. And then it will be given to those drivers that have put in like almost the whole race from the front or the ones that have come maybe done like that extra pit stop gain those 20 seconds and put it into um into first so like the actual driver of the day rather than the person who basically got it to where they should have been i think what's interesting about this year is because of the change of regulations we not only don't know the pecking order we don't know the gaps between the pecking orders right we don't know how fast that top team is going to be compared to everyone else so i think it's really difficult to say interestingly um, the most people, the most votes that we got on, on our podcast, at least, were for Verstappen for Driver of the Day. So whether that's suggesting that people don't think Red Bull are going to be very good, um, which we saw from the general society, but that Verstappen will be fast. And again, we saw that that seems to be like what most people think, I think. So I could certainly see that as an option. Um, Russell, again, I could see as an option because... It's about who you're not expecting to see, right? Even catch with uh, guessing Ricardo because he's had such a bad season last year. It's just those drivers that people like and who are maybe not as expected to get to get quite that high. Mm. I mean, anyone, anyone else got any opinions on who might do well in Driver of the Day, or should we just should we move on quickly? Yeah. In in um. I, th- I think uh, that they could be like um, I-, I think Mick Schumacher or Kevin Magnussen, like the house drivers uh, could win some drives a day just for just for dragging dragging that house into a decent scoring position. L- l- let's I mean let's 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 face it like Haas were coming back off a very poor 2021 ad, so I think if um, Schumacher, uh, if if, Schum- uh, if there's ever a chaotic race and and the Hasses are in like a like at the right position at the right time, then I think I think they def- they definitely do de- uh, deserve it. So, um, but also equal credit should should also be given to Gunther Steiner. Uh, um, because uh, because he was the one who uh, who, uh, who basically led the team from top to bottom. Sorry, I had to mouth uh, mouth that word because everybody knows the all the all the all the memes uh, on, on about has based on what was happened uh, uh, based on dr- drive to survive. Yeah, and uh, we'll move on. Uh, skip a few quickly and move on to which drivers 
We'll score a podium finish this year. A very interesting one here. So, guessing the amount of drivers that will score a podium. Obviously, how many did we have last season? I think, was it 13 in the end? There were a lot. Mm. It was all of the top four, obviously. And then, yeah, I mean, th- at least three others. So, who who didn't? So, it was the Hasses, Latifi... Oh, of course, because both Williams got it as well. Didn't the TV didn't. Hmm? No, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, Russell. Yeah, sorry. One, one Williams got it as well. Yeah. Neither Alpha did. Yeah. So I think there were, I think there were about thirteen drivers that got a podium last season, and we're well, looking through this. So everyone that's responded thinks Hamilton will get a podium. Um, everyone except one person thinks Russell will get a podium. Everyone for Verstappen. Uh, three people don't think Perez will get a podium. Um, one, one. Interestingly, more people think Sainz are going to get a podium than Leclerc. Thirty-two to thirty-one. Then also thirty-two out of thirty-three for Lando Norris. Twenty-five out of thirty-three for Daniel Ricciardo. A bit less than uh, the other seven drivers in what we or what most people think are going to be the top four teams. Uh, Alonso with fifteen. Uh, Ocon with eight. So, um, more people with that confidence in Fernando Alonso. Gasly, very high on 27. In fact, more than Ricardo, even though he's in an Alpha Tari. Sonoda down with six. Probably, I think, the biggest discrepancy between teammates. Vettel on 12. Stroll, just one person thinks Stroll's going to get a podium. A lot. <laughs> Uh, and also one person thinks that Tifi is going to get a podium. Five people think Albon is going to get a podium though. Uh, Bottas, two people think a uh, podium. The only person who no one thinks is going to get a podium, Juan Yujo. And then Mick Schumacher, also on one. And Kevin Magnussen, six people think will get a podium. Probably looking at, I think maybe, what was it? It was Saturday that he set his fastest time. Was it as if... Was Friday, Friday, was oh, the, yeah. Friday was the day he ended up on top, but yeah. I don't know which, which his fastest time was. So maybe Friday playing into that, but an interesting one. I think one of the most interesting ones is that Daniel Ricciardo. Obviously, so the top other seven, uh, 33, 32, 33, 30, 32, 31, and 32, out of 33 people that have responded, whereas Ricciardo down on 25 out of 33. Obviously, we saw, I mean, if you've watched it, you saw the Drive to Survive episode where it detailed his struggles. He's had COVID over the last week. Obviously, he's coming back into the car, so it might take a few races to get back up to speed. But do you think, uh, Bethany, that Ricardo does have a chance at a podium? Do you think that people are being a bit harsh? Yeah, I think people are being a bit harsh. I understand why they're being harsh, because of the fact that, obviously... McLaren having their brake troubles and also Ricardo struggled last year as a whole, but he did get a win, so... Yeah. Also, probably worth mentioning now, I might have been that person who said Latifi would get a podium. <laughs> I mean, the goat that is goat Tifi. <laughs> I, I do Makes think, sense. I do think it'll be interesting to see how many people get podiums this season, especially if it is a lot more balanced. I think you, if it is a lot more balanced, then you'll probably see a few more people getting podiums. I mean... I think we're going to struggle to top 13. 13 is a lot. It was 13 in 2020 as well, I think. Is it? Really? Yeah, so only... The, I think it was only the Haas, the Williams, the Alphas and Kvyat in 2020 yeah. didn't get podiums. Okay. I was so annoyed Kvyat didn't get a podium. Why can't we just make it the top seven teams? And then even Kvyat, I think, got fourth place in Imola. So, good, uh, good going. And then obviously... In um, uh, yeah, in 2021, 13 as well. I think the a few. I think a month, so. I think it was both Hasses, both Alphas, Latifi, Stroll, and Sonoda didn't get a podium last season. I think uh, Sonoda coming the closest with a fourth in Abu Dhabi. Yep. So almost there as well. So do you? I mean. Are there any on that list that you are surprised by? Do you think that there some people have got a better chance, or maybe a worse chance, that people are giving them credit for? I think Vettel versus Stroll is a little bit mean. Um, Twelve votes to one. Um, I think that's very dependent on on how the Aston Martin does. If it's quick, then I 
I'd say either of them are just as likely. Um, I could see you know people thinking Vettel's a little bit better because he, he did score he did score higher and he's he is a fraction faster, but that's that's a massive discrepancy between the the two teammates at least. And I mean, does anyone else have any opinions on his teammates in particular? Do you think Gasly and Sonoda maybe is a bit of a harsh one? Obviously, Gasly, more people think he's going to get a podium than Ricardo in a McLaren. Whereas Sonoda, down in sixth, obviously less than Vettel, equal with Kevin Magnussen in a house. Do you think that, especially maybe, has the, has the Alpha Tauri been that especially quick? It sort of flew under the radar. It's been another one that's under the radar, yeah, but it's, they've had a pretty clean running throughout. Gasly crashed admittedly in, in Spain, but um, uh, that was a minor one. Yeah, they've, done, they've not really had any issues in testing. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to be fairly quick this year. I, th- I think uh, with AlphaTauri's constructor position, that's going to depend a lot on Yuki Tsunoda because um, Gas- Ga- Gasly, let- let's face it, Gasly pretty much carried most of uh, most of the team last year. At one point, Yuki Tsunoda and George Russell were like almost uh, clo- close close to each other until Yuki got that fourth place in. Abu Dhabi. So this year it's a make or break for Yuki, and if Yuki, and I'm not necessarily saying Yuki should be uh, Pierre Gasly, but if he can get close closer to Gasly, then that that might uh, that might mean that um, it could be justified for Yuki to rem- uh, remain in Alpha, Alpha Tauri for another year, and and and. And for me, like, um, I, d- I do think, like, with um, with Yuki's struggle, like, adapting to F1, it, wa- it, it, it was very difficult for him mentally. So I think, like, having that year's worth of, a year worth of experience learning from, and also especially aid by Gasly, I think he will, I think he will definitely make, a big step forward going into the 2022 season. He could score a podium. He might not, but um, yeah, if, if uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see on his homecoming reception when we go back. When we when F1 returns to Suzuka in October, huh? Mm. And what we'll do, we'll take a quick break in a second, but we'll finally look at some of the crazy and wild predictions that the lovely folks at the Warwick F1 Society have made. So I'll run through there. Uh, I'll run through some of them quickly. So Mazepin to return to Formula 1 at some point this season. Please no. Christian Horner to show up at a race viewing of the Clarendon. (laughs) See, I don't want to say he might be a bit busy for all of the race viewings. But it's yeah, uh, that's a conspiracy theory. (laughs) Yeah, I I can't imagine he's doing anything during the races. Uh, Joe and Bottas both have more DNFs than points scored. It's possible. Possible. Uh, Schumacher outscores K. Mike has to score points. I don't think that one's that one's surely that one's not looking wild anymore. I think has, no. has looked nailed on for at least some points this year. Yeah, that, I think that's someone's like safe bet, isn't it? Yeah, there'll be a race with at least eight retirements. I saw a few of them. I think in 2019 there's one with seven retirements, but I'm not sure. 19 there was one with uh, nine. Was there? Yeah. Oh yeah, that was the German Grand Prix. German Grand Prix. Right. Everybody okay. just went absolutely berserk on the last last corner, and oh oh oh, I, actually, actually oh. that was seven retirements, and then you had the two Alphas who got this. No, no, they got a thirty second time. It was definitely, or was it seven? Oh, I can't remember. I remember there was the twenty twenty. Was it the Austrian or the Syrian Grand Prix? I can't remember which. Yes, yes, yeah, Austria. That was it. Because. <laughs> The TV came the 11th. The TV came 11 from Russell retired, yeah. And he was ahead of Russell for all of the season because of that. Up, yeah, up like, it, and as a result of that race, if it wasn't for Russell's Mercedes drive, the TV would have been ahead of him in the championship yeah. that year. Um, the Carlos Sainz will be on the podium for second position in Barcelona on the, tw- on the, on the 20th of May. Is that when the Spanish Grand Prix is? Yeah. That one comes right then, fair play. Both Ferrari drivers will have more points than Max at the end of the season. Eh, it's possible. Uh, Joe will get 15 points 
Is that 15 plus or just 15? It says 15, so I'm taking it as 15, 15 exactly. Is it, oh, no, it's not 15 factorial. <laughs> in the wrong way. Uh, album podium. Uh, Gasly to Ferrari. That's a bold one. Uh, Schumacher outscores Vettel. Eh, it could happen. Uh, triple brick podium at Silverstone. I don't think it will happen, but I really want it to. <laughs> uh, Vettel doesn't spin for the first five races. Yeah, that's not <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lando Norris first win. Haas will win a race. <laughs> <laughs> now that is bold. <laughs> like we're laughing and they're just going to rock up at like, Bahrain and be three seconds a lap quicker than everyone else. Mazepin to return to Haas as a reserve driver this time. Hopefully not. Bottas will beat Hamilton in three or more races. <laughs> we might have to clarify whether that's including Hamilton DNFs or not. Uh, Honda will agree to return to F1 before the end of the year. Haven't they already agreed to return to F1? No, they're, they're doing work in the background, but they're not officially part of it. Uh, that's that's my prediction. So. Haas will score a point. We've had that one already. Uh, Oscar won't make it home after a heavy circle. Not sure how F1 related that is, but by all means. Mick to finish top five in a race. Uh, Seb podium. Haas podium. I, th- I think Haas could get a podium this season, looking at their form. I think it's possible. Mazepin, uh, Haas is a consistent midfield team. I think that one's probably going to come true. Mazepin track invasion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, four red flags in races. So what? Four races that are red flagged. How many did we get this season? It must have been more than that, because there were two yeah. alone at Saudi. So. Okay, we had Saudi Arabia... Uh, Imola. Silverstone, Imola, Baku, Baku, Spa wasn't a race. <laughs> there might, I feel like there was one more somewhere. There were two at Saudi, though, weren't there? Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, did so you count? Did you count that? Yeah, okay. That's five. Then was there one more? I'm sure that probably was. All right, whatever. Yeah. yeah. There was about five. Um, four cars oh, out. Um, of- do you say Imola? Yeah, we said oh, that. Damn it. Four cars out of the first corner in Australia. We haven't had a good uh, Australian Turn 1 crash <laughs> in a while. After the, the, Those are the classics in the early 2000s and mid-2010s. Uh, Alban pole position. Now, that's a bold one. Mm. Uh, Ferrari and Mercedes will dominate, and Red Bull will be at least 100 points off the champion constructor. Mm, it's possible. Russell and Hamilton will get into a cap fight, and then Joe will beat Bottas on points and out qualify him that's, that's not happening that's, that's not, not happening, that's not happening. <laughs> but I mean we can at least we can all agree that that's not the worst prediction that someone has made <laughs> and that would be me that was my prediction which we won't let go no you won't let go <laughs> because it was it was such a bad it's just idea karma. at the time yeah, it's it got just karma. it was somehow a bad idea that got worse <laughs> Um, yeah, so we'll take another break and we'll come back and talk. We'll talk Bahrain because as of now, it's 2.43. So in 17 minutes, it'll be 3 o'clock and then we'll have exactly four days? Five days? Four days. Something like that. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Just yeah. four days left till the lights go out for the first race of the season. But first, as I was saying, we'll take a break. Here is Against the Current with Wildfire. And we are back for the final segment of the Warwick F1 show. I hope you've enjoyed our almost two-hour season review now as we've been talking through everything that is about to happen over the next um, nine, eight, eight months, nine months. What month? So December. So, yeah, nine months. No, it's actually November. They're ending it. Is it? it? Yeah, they're ending it early because of the World Cup. Eight and a half months. Eight and a half months. But first... In just uh, four days, the lights go out. In just two days, we return for some competitive racing as F1 returns to the Bahrain Grand Prix, the season opener for the second year in a row now. Obviously, we had it at Bahrain in 2021, and I would say it brought us one of the best races of the season. It was a good race. It was definitely a good race. Um, there were some talks about track limits, and I'm hoping they fix those up. But yeah, no, it was that. It really set the tone for the Hamilton Verstappen uh, battle throughout the whole year. And I wouldn't want. It's such a good season opener. I think testing is very good there. Um, I, the tracks are a good mix of um, of fast and slow corners. It, it gives good. It gives a good impression to start off the season. 
it's such it's a very good first sector as well obviously there's that hard breaking zone into uh turn one and then you've got that left right which allows for drivers to either go side by side or sort of like switch back on one another then the run up to turn four we've seen a bunch of overtakes there, a bunch of good battles going through turn four into five and six and then obviously a bit maybe a bit less of overtaking through those uh from then on but that first sector probably I, it's one of the best sectors in Formula One that I can think of. I think just the way it flows, the way it allows for those overtakings, for that side-by-side -side battle, and especially, hopefully, with the new regs, with the new cars uh, coming in, it might allow for even more, even more good action at the start of the race in particular. I mean, there's not much to add to that. and uh, There are some... It feels a little generic, but you're right. It does, in some ways, it does stand out. It's just... Everything's done right. It's, it's it's clean. I can't explain it. But it's simple but effective. Yes, that's that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and I mean, Chime, what are you are you sort of happy we're coming to Bahrain for the first race of the season? Obviously, we've had it. We had it in Australia for a number of years. Then, obviously, with the pandemic, we moved to uh, Austria in 2020, moving to Bahrain in 2021, and we're back there in 2022. Do you think? Bahrain works better than Austria of Austria or well, yeah, yeah, I guess Austria or Australia uh, as a season opener. I would say yeah, it just works just as well, if not slightly better than Australia. I mean look at last year's absolute titan of a race last 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 year and then especially when we had the whole precursor to the whole championship fight and everything. But yeah, as long as I saw the track a lot as long as the original was track limits on turn four, it's a brilliant track to mm. do anyway. And um, so some of the drivers that have done well there, Bethany, obviously Hamilton being very successful at Bahrain, Vettel as well. And then we've got some of the drivers that are probably in with a bit more of a chance at the track. Uh, Charles Leclerc obviously could have taken his first win in 2019, had his car sort of not broken down. Do you think as Verstappen, Verstappen has never won at, um, at Bahrain? Obviously, Russell would have been close to winning at the secure layout had he not um, had his puncture and other issues. Do you think that we might see a new winner, might see a first-time winner at the track, or do you think that the experience that maybe Hamilton or, or to a lesser extent, Leclerc, being in the lead, being um, up the front, will bring? And Do you think that maybe they've got a bit more of a chance to take that victory? Personally, I think that Ferrari's probably got going to have one of, if not the best car going into Bahrain. And as a result, I think that it's going to... I think that the safest bet to go for and probably the most likely, in my opinion, is going to be Charles to win. OK. Uh, Ziga, have you got anything else you want to say about Bahrain? I mean, very, I think, just a very good track, very solid season opener. And then as we move, we move to Saudi Arabia... Just next week as well. We've got two races back to back. None, none of this uh, three week gap between Bahrain and Imola as we saw last season. We're straight away going on. Are you looking forward to the race on su Sunday? I think ever since it's moved, uh, moved to under the floodlights, it's always been a thriller. Like when we when I, when I first saw Lewis and Nico fighting it out, like that was just like that was just be beauty. Like to see two drivers like racing each other whilst also looking after their tyres like that I feel like the floodlight makes everything much more ex exciting as opposed to just like sitting in the in in, in, in the desert heat uh, so I think like I ex yeah I think like Barre will could could prove another uh, could be another thriller of a an o opener this weekend though if I if I'd say something for improvement in the future, they could uh, throw the secure layout for the first Grand Prix and see, uh, and which which would be interesting because like that means cars are forced to use more power on their engine and because it's so early in the season, we don't know how well the engines perform and some of them might uh, might drop out early due to reliability issues like we saw in Austria in 2020. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll have to wait and see. But first, it's the return of the weekly 
host versus host prediction game. It's going to be me and Chime as we take you through this season. Obviously, last year, I think ended in a draw. Was I was I right? Yeah, I believe it was four to four. But of course, it didn't go over the whole season. We were meant to have twenty three races, and now it's an even number again. So uh, you guys well, better make when, sure you. Well, you're when I extra. win, when I win twenty two nil, okay. it won't matter. So obviously, so a point. Come on, Chime, beef him yes. back. So what? What were the rules? So it was a. Yes. I think let's formalise them a bit more. So I think for the podium, three points if you get the driver spot on. So if let's say Hamilton wins and you predict a Hamilton win, you get three points. If Hamilton wins and you predict to say Hamilton third, you get one point. And then uh, for the general predictions, we'll do we'll do a three, two, one scale. So if you've got it bang on, if it's like Carlos Sainz to do two pit stops and get the fastest lap, and you've got that perfect then you get three points, and then maybe two and one if it's slightly less accurate. Are we all happy with those rules? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Chime and, yeah. Chime and Will's yeah. got to be the most important ones from that one, right? <laughs> My only concern is that you could just do incredibly vague predictions and get three points from them, potentially. We're, we're, we operate on an honesty no, no, no. policy I, here. I th- No, I think it's like... You, it must be correct but you get one point if it's a boring prediction and it's correct oh, yeah. two points uh, yeah it's it's for the guests to decide right it, you're going to leave it, it for that yeah I think okay. it allows it allows for more specific predictions to potentially earn higher points because yeah, otherwise it would just be boring and vague and you just get one point and it, it'd be boring but so we'll we'll go for those rules I think those rules are quite a good one so I'll start with my biggest big rival my nemesis, the person <laughs> I'm facing in this competition, uh, Chimay and his team with Bethany and Ziga. So we'll start off with the podiums for each of us. So what podium have you gone for? Charlotte Claire winning, Lewis Hamilton second, Max Verstappen third. Ooh, that's a good, that's a good one. So you think all, all three teams potentially up there, you think Ferrari may be taking the cake for the first episode, but Hamilton and Verstappen hot on their or hot on Charles Leclerc's heels. Uh Jack, what have we what have we gone for? You've gone for very similar to start off with. You've gone for Sainz first and Hamilton second, and then I decided um we we'd scrap Verstappen from third and put Russell in instead. I don't know what it is about Red Bull, but no one seems to like them very much. Um so yeah, the the Mercedes two three. Yeah, I can't did something happen with Red Bull that will make them really, really dislikable last season? No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no, no clue. But yeah, Maybe I, just Karen Horner, but he did. He just does complain a lot. <laughs> but I can't say that because we want him on the show. Be like, why do you complain? We want him at the Clarendon for a race viewing, <laughs> <That's> right? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's a legend of the sport. I mean, he, he... yeah. So we've gone for Science Hamilton and Russell. We think maybe Mercedes. Hot on the heels of the set, not the second Ferrari, but the second Ferrari driver. And we'll do our general weekend predictions now as well. I've done one of them. So I've gone for Haas to score points. I think Haas coming out of the blocks, maybe maybe a bit of a boring one. Maybe if that comes right, we only get one or two points. But Haas to score points, I think they'll come out of the blocks. I think they'll put their development into good use. So I saw a great thing where it was like, Haas used Magnussen in 2020, fired him for 2021 to get some money in didn't develop the car and then brought magnuson back for 2022 to uh have with a good car with some good money in the bank so and potentially i think they're going to score points but jack what what are your two obviously you're on my team this uh, so i went for a catastrophic failure of some mechanical kind during the race so kind of on the level of um Boemi's wheels popping off or uh, or uh, Latifi catching on fire in testing, um, which I feel like is a little bit more bold than Haas scoring points, but certainly plausible. It's the first race of a new, uh, new set of regulations. And then thirdly, I went for the pole sitter is more than a second ahead of the next driver that isn't their teammate. So you see, like the, the, the top team is more than a second ahead. Um, on 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 Sun Saturday. That, that that is a bold prediction. You reckon? You reckon with all the all the all the stuff that's been done to keep the cars close together yeah. in terms of times, it just won't work. More than a second. <laughs> Always optimistic to hear. And Chime, what, what are your three? Just to round it off. Well, my first one is actually pretty similar, but a lot bit more specific. We've got Magnussen game P eight. Oh, that's that's a, that's a three pointer if it comes yeah. true. Um, 
Williams will reach Q3. And okay. then... Okay. A Vettel spin <laughs> in any oh, okay. session. So you, you, we went one, two, three, and you went three, two, <laughs> yeah. one with it. We're, we are, we're, undermining, we're undermining the predict, the crazy prediction that Vettel won't spin in the first five races instantly in the first race. <laughs> and the funny thing is I made the prediction for the predictions. <laughs> <It's> you. <laughs> yes. He's hedging his bets. I mean, from what I understand, they can both come true if, if, if that's... If that, if your prediction on there is just the is just the races, because yeah, what if well, so he, spins he spins quality in pra- practice quali- and not practice the race. or quali? Okay. This is why we use technicalities. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, technicalities! We love we love a good interpretation of the rule book that definitely wasn't allowed. Still not over it. Can we get back on track? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we still got, we got the Abu Dhabi report this weekend as well. We have lots to talk about next week. Well, before. We look at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix and look back over the Bahrain Grand Prix. Thank you for listening wherever you are. Obviously, if you're listening before the weekend, make sure to come to the Clarendon for three o'clock as we can watch. For two o'clock, come on. Yeah, for two o'clock. We've got to get ready, got to get hyped. Obviously, we'll see in qualifying, we'll maybe see which cars are the quickest. But I'm sure, as we saw last year, there'll be lots to talk about over the entire season obviously just four days away now from the lights going out has anyone got anything else they want to say um thanks for letting me host um it's been a lovely time over the last uh nearly a year now but uh yeah i'll i'll stick around i'll come back for 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 plenty of guest appearances don't worry it's all right thank you for allowing me to be part of the wonderful f1 society structure conglomerate if you will <laughs> we're not a conglomerate <laughs> it, it will it will eventually end up being a con- conglomerate but obviously me and Chime will be taking you through the entire season we'll be we'll be diving into the ins and outs of f1 uh Chime will probably be taking more of the off weeks and more of the races that or more of the weekends without the races i'll be guiding you through all of the race reviews and hopefully we have one of the best seasons in a long time Hopefully, yep. I can't wait. To, I can't wait for the season, man. Just let it come now. Oh, Jack! Jack is jumping for joy here. I'm but so yes, hyped. It should be a good one. It is looking like one of the best seasons in a long time, and we've got to wait and see how it goes. Bethany and Ziga, got anything else you want to say? You know what? Let's uh, let's let's enjoy barring Grand Prix at Clarendon. If if not. Enjoy it wherever you are. It could be in in a pub mm. or on a plane. <laughs> As a, I actually remember when I was going to Spain, uh, my friend was watching one well, uh, I mean a pra- uh, Abu Dhabi practice uh, on his phone before we took off. <laughs> yeah, just thank you for having me. Thank you for setting up such a wonderful show and just yeah, looking forward to where this t- t- comes in fu- where this goes in the future. No, I'm sure it'll be a good one, and I'm sure we won't be able to escape arguments and Twitter rivalries throughout. But thank you for listening, and make sure you're looking forward to the first race of the season coming up this weekend.